good morning. Glad to have everybody here today. And if we have any visitors, welcome. And we would love to see you back. If you could please sign the black book at the end of the pew to let us know that you are here. And we would love to see you back. And welcome to Concordia. Just a few announcements. Um, if you'll note that the June council meeting will be held Sunday, June 15th at 7 a.m., which is not the um, routine time, so just note that. And the following graduates are gonna be recognized today. It's Graduate Sunday. It's a very exciting time to recognize uh, those that are graduating from high school and college. We have Jonathan Galloway, Chris Overcash, Alex Reed, Mackenzie Dabb, Savannah Goodnight, and Connie Lemon. So we're looking forward to that. And I hope that everybody will join us after the service uh, for a lunch to recognize our graduates. We have a Kids for Christ event coming up. The last event for the KFC group will be on June 14th. Omar and Jan Williams are gracious enough to share their uh, lake home with us. And the kids are going to um, enjoy a time at the lake and uh, celebrate a very fun uh, KFC season. Also, the Friends and Fellowship Circle on Thursday, June 5th, if you'll note, we need to bring ingredients um, and baking pans, and which will be a challenge for myself, who doesn't cook much. But uh, we will be uh, baking goodies for our fundraiser at the Nazareth Children's Home, which will be on the 7th, the 7th of, uh, which is a Saturday, and it's to raise money for the Nazareth Children's Home. So I hope that everybody will be able to join us. And if we can please stand to, set to uh, recognize and acknowledge our 2014 graduates. We are delighted to have you here, and just a reminder, a reminder that also following our worship this morning, we will be gathering for a meal at the end of the service, and we hope that you can come be a part of that. A reminder to our graduates that, um, and families is that afterwards, uh, the graduates will be here to greet the congregation, and then we ask them to remain and to take some pictures which is always the most popular thing that graduates can do, is take pictures. So anyway, if you are here, we are glad that you are here. Welcome. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we hope that you will come back and visit with us once again. Let us begin with our worship, and we begin this morning in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given us his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for the salvation, our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, your Son, our Savior, is with you in eternal glory. Give us faith to see that true to his promise, he is among us still, and we will be and will be with us to the end of time. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen.
As, uh, as we get ready to invite our children forward, just a reminder that uh, we do not have children's church in June, July, and August. So the, uh, the children are welcome to come uh, and uh, sit with their parents and enjoy the rest of the service. And then one other announcement, I wanted to let folks know that next Sunday, next Sunday uh, at both the early and the late service, we will be receiving new members. It'll be Pentecost Sunday, uh, so that will be just a joyful celebration. So uh, we hope that you will be here, and we ask the children to come down for the children's message. show me what does it look like to pray? What does it look like when we're praying? Okay. Do we just have to be in church to pray? Do we have to say certain words to talk to God? Well, it really doesn't matter what we say to Him. The important thing is that we talk to God. We have conversations with Him just like you talk to your friends and your cousins and your brothers and your sisters. Jesus wants us to talk to God just like he did. Now, uh, when we pray, all we're doing is talking to God. So the cool thing is, you can talk to him all the time. You don't have to have a phone to call him. He hears you no matter where you are, and he's always listening to what you have to say. Now, do you know that you're prayed for? People pray for you. Now, you know your mom and dad pray for you and your grandparents. Did you know your teachers pray for you and our pastors pray for you? Well, in the Bible, in John 17, um, it tells us that Jesus prayed for his disciples and he prayed for you. He prayed that his disciples would care for each other and that you will care for each other. Um, sometimes we only think about praying for our family. Maybe when you get ready to say your prayers at night, you um, pray for your mom and your dad and people that live in your house. And, yes, we do. But we can also pray for other people too. So this week, I wonder, could we pray for other people? Let's, I want you to pray for your church friends. Okay. So before we leave, before we leave, I'm going to give each of you a star out of my bag. And each star has somebody's name on it that I want you to say a prayer for sometime this week. Okay? But before you go, and before I hand out our stars, can you pray with me? Okay. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and giving us your son Jesus as an example of how we should love one another. Help us to share your love with others and pray for all people as Jesus prayed for us. Be with each of these children in the coming week and keep them in your care. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'll come up and line up, I'm going to let you reach in my bag and pick a star. Just get one. And I want you to say a special prayer for this person one day this week. Okay. Have a good week. All right, there you go. You won't know what my favorite color is. That's my color too. Okay. All right. <coughs> Make sure this starts. 
So there you go, back to your moms and dads. Let us read uh, Psalm 68, verses 1 through 10, responsibly. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke, and as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice for him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. His God is in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. When you, God, went out before your people, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, you gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Your people settled in it. And from your bounty, God, you provided the poor. As we prepare to hear our reading from Acts, the 17th chapter, this will be the text that will be the basis of the sermon this morning. And I want you to, to hear and be aware of a couple of things. Paul comes into Athens and he is overwhelmed by the fact that the city of Athens is worshiping so many idols, but they do not know of Jesus Christ. Paul responds to them and begins to teach them and shows them how the idols are not necessary, but it is in Jesus Christ that we have the one truth that will be with us always. Here from Acts, the 17th chapter. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was, greeted, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Ergopas, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in a meeting of the Ergopas and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands. If he needed anything, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine things that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. 
In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand. Today, our gospel is from the 17th chapter of St. John, and as we heard in our children's sermon this morning, this is one of those readings and one of those speeches of Jesus that has real take-home value. We know exactly what he's doing, and he calls us to do the same. Jesus is praying, and he's praying to none other than God, and he is modeling what that looks like for us as a form of faithfulness. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. After Jesus said this, he looked toward the heaven and prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. And Jesus continued, I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And God has come to me through them. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. <clears throat> Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Lord. Will you pray with me, please? Most gracious and holy God, sometimes we take it for granted that you call us to yourself. Lord God, we ask that you would open our ears and open our hearts, that not only may we hear your call, but we may be obedient to you as we see in you the way, the truth, and the life in all things. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I encourage you um, from your bulletin to have the, um, the New Testament reading in front of you. I'll be referring specifically to a few things in the midst of that. Over the, um, really over the time that I have been here and even before in my own family, some big events in a family has, has always been surrounded around a 50th wedding anniversary. 50th wedding anniversaries are, um, are always a good time for small family celebrations, maybe small gatherings, maybe even large gatherings, whatever it is, that 50th wedding anniversary is, is always special. And uh, we're going to see how well you know your um, I guess we could say your uh, anniversaries 
50th wedding anniversary, what is the symbol for the 50th? It is gold. That's right. Um, for the 25th wedding anniversary, the symbol is silver. silver. That's correct. For the 10th wedding anniversary, what is, what is the symbol? Fertilizer? Did somebody say fertilizer? <laughs> I don't. That's not on my list, but it could be. Tenth, the 10th tenth wedding anniversary, what's the symbol? Aluminum. Men do not get any crazy ideas. Or tin. Aluminum or tin. Uh, number one is the first anniversary is paper. First anniversary is paper. Uh, can't you just see some lazy husband coming up with a paper airplane or something like that? Uh, now here's some of the, the ones that go beyond 50. Let's see if you know any of these. Uh, the 60th wedding anniversary is ruby. Now, now some of these vary, depends on the resources. The 70th, the 70th is a pearl. And I think probably most everybody know what the 75th is diamond. That's right, diamond. Uh, now I want you to imagine, imagine a couple that's been married for 75 years, okay? Imagine a couple that's been married for 75 years. And for every year that they had a significant anniversary, and by the way, there are um, at least the couple places I checked, it's every five years there's a significant anniversary. Um, if you can imagine for every five or ten year anniversary, this couple who's been married for 75 years, let's imagine they have this huge mantle above their fireplace. They have this huge mantle above their fireplace and on this mantle, and it would have to be big, is a gift given to them for each significant anniversary. First anniversary for paper, the second for aluminum. That one still gets me. I don't know about that one. Uh, the 15th, which is actually silk or linen. The diamond, the pearl, the ruby, the silver, the gold, all of those things. Imagine that all on that one mantelpiece. Now, put yourselves in the place of Paul. Imagine that you are St. Paul, as in our reading today from, uh, from Acts. You're in the shoes of St. Paul, and you go into Athens, and you walk through the city, and all you see, you see gold idols, you'll see things cut out of marble, things cut out of stone, you will see all of these things around their neck. You will see anything and everything put in high places or being sold in the marketplace and being worshipped. Okay? Whereas with a couple married 75 years, those things would be special gifts. But when Paul came into Athens, he saw all of these things, and they weren't knickknacks, they weren't gifts, but they were the object of the faithfulness of the people. Now, it's interesting because he says in the uh, 29th chapter, or the 29th verse of our reading, if you have that in front of you, he says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like silver or gold or stone. He said there's nothing wrong with those things, but if, he tells them, if we look at those things as an image of something we worship, then we're looking in all of the wrong places. And that was Paul's worry. Remember, Greece to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the people of Jesus' time was one of the far ends of the world. And it amazed Paul that they were worshiping all of these things and knew very little of Jesus Christ. Well, there's a group of two types of people. Uh, if you look at the 18th verse, there are the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, I know you did not come to church this morning to learn about the Epicureans and the Stoics. But you might actually know some who are like that. The Epicureans were the ones, they had no god or no gods. They worshipped no idols. They didn't care about any of that. They did, what they, they did what they wanted, when they wanted, and in the manner in which they wanted. The Epicureans, they had their own thing going, and it was all individual. The Stoics, however, 
The Stoics, however, did not worship one god, such as the god of the sun, the moon, the god of fertility, the god of the sky, the earth, the water. The Stoics, they probably had a dozen, two dozen gods in their midst that they acknowledged and worshipped. But see, Paul comes in, and Paul looks at this, it just knocks the wind out of him, and Paul says, this is not how it works. Paul says this is not how it works. In fact, look at verse 22. Paul says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. To an unknown God. And Paul continues, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So Paul, being a mouthpiece of God, Paul continues to share with them the good news of Christ. Paul shares with them the good news of Christ. He says it's not in pearls, it's not in silver or gold and rubies, it's not even in an altar to whom they had no clue who it was built, but they knew they needed to build it. But Paul makes it very clear. He says it is God who reaches out to us. It is a God who beckons us to come close. It is a God who forgives us and gives us life in all things. And he does that through Jesus Christ. And he does that through Jesus Christ. In fact, look at verse 28. Verse 28 says... For in him, and this is Paul speaking about Jesus, for in him we live and move and we have our being. We only need one of those. And Paul made it very clear to them that everything else was in terms of what they worshipped and who they worshipped was a waste of time. That it was Christ himself that they needed. With this morning being a day that we honor our graduates, uh, a particular conversation um, that my dad had with me uh, right before, after I graduated, literally it was about a week or two before I went to college. And I remember my dad, I, it's one of those things, do you ever have one of those conversations with someone, it was years ago, you can remember the room and you can even remember exactly where you sat when you had that conversation. You have that? I mean, you had one of those before. Um, I remember we were sitting on a sofa. I remember where I was sitting. And I remember my dad said, he said, when you go off to college, he said, be aware of cults. Okay, think about that for a moment. He said, be aware of cults. And of course, being 18, my first unspoken thought was, yeah, right. That's not going to be an issue, please. But then I started, and then years later, I was thinking more about it, and I remembered that my dad, he re it was very clear for him in the 60s and in the early 70s how powerful of a thing that was. You remember in the 60s, you had the Charles Manson uh, cult and several spinoffs of that, to which was very devastating, actually, to the whole country. And then in the early 70s, if those of you in your uh, 50s or 60s or 70s remember Patricia Hearst, who was uh, engaged, um, who was brought in and allegedly brainwashed by a cult. And there have been others even in recent years. When that was mentioned to me, I didn't think about it then. But we think back and we realize any thing that someone says is the truth or the way or the light other than Jesus Christ is what? It is a cult. You know, that's a, that's a very odd thing to say and I don't think that's ever that word I've actually used in the pulpit before. But Paul tells us very plainly. Paul tells us very plainly that anything that we put in God's place Anything that we put in God's place that we want to act like, be like, 
or even feel like God through Jesus Christ. That is not the truth. And so what Paul does, Paul lifts them up. Paul doesn't seem to get too rough with, with them as he does in other uh, times when he's talking to non-believers. But Paul shares with them very, very carefully. He says, in the past, God overlooked these things, but now he commands everyone to turn to him. And you know, it's a very humbling thing. It is a very humbling thing to stand before God, before our God, and know that we're not perfect. It is a very humbling thing to stand before our God and know that in no way whatsoever do we match up to his expectations. It is a very humbling thing for us to even come to church on a Sunday and come face to face with God, even as we will this morning with the body and blood of Christ and Holy Communion. <clears throat> However, isn't that exactly where we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be here because through our baptism we are called to be here. We are supposed to be here because God through Jesus Christ has made it possible to be here. We do not match up right, but it's Jesus that brings us here. And it is Jesus that beckons us to come a little closer, to make our actions reflected a little brighter, and to make our words express the joys of Christ just a little bit louder. So if you have an anniversary coming up in your family anytime soon, um, as a man, I would advise you to go get those cards early because they get all the good ones get taken really fast. You just can't get a you know, happy birthday card and scratch it out. It doesn't work. Trust me, it doesn't work. <laughs> but you know, one of the great gifts we have is that God has given us the gift of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be gold or silver. It doesn't have to be ruby or pearl or diamond. It doesn't even have to be aluminum or paper or linen. Because God cannot be contained in gifts like that. God cannot be contained in what we write in a card. God cannot be contained even in the most Talent, talented, crafted statue. God cannot be contained in those things. But God holds us close and makes us strong and empowers us to stand before him. And when we fall and when we fail, it is Jesus Christ who is there, offers, offers, offers his hand, pulls us up, and says, you are forgiven, go and sin no more. There is no card that will convey that. But thankfully, Jesus Christ does. Amen.
As God's holy people unified in our baptism into Christ, let us confess our faith and do that with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He is the now, on the third day he rose again. He is into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> to the Concordia Lutheran Church graduation celebration. On behalf of Concordia, Lisa Hartzell has a gift for each of the seniors that have graduated to remind them of our love and support in all their future endeavors. Jordan Hanbarger has also made a DVD for each graduate uh, and a slideshow that will be playing during lunch in the Family Life Center. You may pick up your gifts and pictures for the slideshow in the Family Life Center today. Katie Ashley is a junior at South Durant and she will be our marshal for today. Thank you for your assistance, Katie. We're blessed to have the opportunity to recognize three high school and three college graduates today. Families, you are asked to stand when your graduate's name is called and remain standing while they're introduced. Graduates, when I call your name, please come forward and stand beside me. We'll begin with our high school graduates and follow with the college graduates. First is, will the family of Jonathan Royce Galloway Jr. please stand? Jonathan is the son of Jonathan and the late Ruby Galloway. He's the great-grandson of Mabel and the late Royce Galloway. Jonathan will graduate from Northwest Cabarrus on June 14, 2014. He plans to attend Rowan Cabarrus Community College and then transfer to UNC Charlotte and pursue his interest in criminal justice. His family may be seated. Next will the family of Christopher Frank Overcash please stand. Christopher is the son of Melinda Overcash. She has five, si five siblings, Anna, Juan, Giovanni, Javier, and Martin. Christopher is the grandson of Doug Overcash and the great-grandson of Frank and Kamalita Overcash. Chris will graduate from South Iran on June 12, 2014. He will attend UNC Charlotte on an Army scholarship and major in mechanical engineering. After completing his education, he will begin a military career as a mechanical engineer. Chris's family may be seated. Will the family of Alex Paul Reed please stand? Alex Paul Reed is the son of Ken and Leslie Reed. He has two brothers, Curtis and Jack. Alex is the grandson of Wayne and Brenda Reed and Dennis and Linda Moritz. Alex will graduate from South Iran on June 12, 2014. He plans to attend UNC Charlotte and major in marketing, with future plans to start his own business. Alex's family may be seated. This completes our high school graduates. We'll move on to the college graduates. Will the family of Mackenzie Brooks, Brooke Dabbs please stand? Mackenzie Brooke Dabbs is the daughter of Kenny and Melinda Dabbs. She has one sister, Erin. Mackenzie is the granddaughter of Frankie and Wayne Dabbs, Becky Waller, and Bill Waller. Mackenzie will graduate from Paul Mitchell School in Charlotte on September 13th. She plans to work in a salon and eventually open up her own business. Mackenzie, your family may be seated. Will the family of Savannah Marlene Goodnight please stand? 
Savannah is the daughter of Henry Goodnight and Julie Goodnight. She has one brother, Dallas. She is the granddaughter of Lee and Hilda Goodnight and C.D. and Marlene Roseman. Savannah graduated from Rowan Cabarrus Community College on May 16th with a degree in criminal justice. In the future, Savannah plans to find a job in criminal justice. You may be seated. Will the family of Connie McLaughlin Lohman please stand? Connie McLaughlin Lohman is the daughter of Mike and Kitty McLaughlin. She is the wife of Jody Lohman and mother Emily and Andrew. She is the granddaughter of Helen and the late Paul McLaughlin and Ethel and the late Dennis Comer. Connie graduated from NCANT State University in December 2013 with a master's degree in elementary education. Connie says teaching is her calling and completing her master's degree renewed her sense of purpose and strengthened her ability to lead. As a fifth year teacher at her school, her peers surprised her this year by selecting her as their teacher of the year. She just started an after school Lego club at her school and will lead a session for staff on teaching with Legos. She will continue this program next year and will also be coaching the school's first robotics team. She has been asked by her alma mater to teach a summer academy for beginning teachers in July. Connie plans to continue using her abilities to lead and motivate others and to inspire, inspire our students and other teachers. Most importantly, Connie is looking forward to catching up on precious time with her family this summer. Congratulations to all our graduates and their families. I will now turn it over to Pastor Ken for a blessing. Now see, this will be, this will be more enjoyable to you than your graduations because there's no commencement speaker. There is no commencement speaker. However, we do hear some very important words. And I ask you to, to hear and share together. I'll let you hear these words from Ephesians, the first chapter. In Christ, you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you have believed in him. We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And then finally, a reading from Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. And if you have been in the youth basement in the last several years, this reading from Jeremiah is actually on, is actually on the wall. And it's something that these young people have seen for a good many years. And it's a great reminder of where we stand as God's people. Jeremiah says, For surely I know the plans I have of you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope, then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Dear Christian friends, baptized into the priesthood of Christ, we are all called by the Holy Spirit to offer ourselves um, to the God of all creation in thanksgiving for what he has done and continues to do for us. And today we affirm our members who are graduating as they seek to carry out their vocations as Christians in the world. Let us pray responsibly. Gracious and holy God, we give thanks to you for the accomplishments of these graduates. You have walked with them through times of excitement and frustration. As they continue their journey of faith, Carry them through all they will encounter. Grant patience and perseverance all their ways. Equip and empower them to be faithful as disciples of Jesus Christ. And fill them with all joy and peace and So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they Jonathan. Christopher, Alex, <coughs> Mackenzie, Connie, and Savannah. Oh Lord, we ask that you keep each one of them in your care. Nurture them with your love, comfort their hearts, and establish them in every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Now, I told them this would be very simple. Uh, it would only last a few minutes. But I thought it would be good if we just opened it up for questions and we could just ask some <laughs> questions. Uh, everything is on the table, algebra, calculus, physics. Uh, are you okay with that as junior marshal? No? Okay. No? No, good, we don't want to do that. On behalf of Concordia, we want to say thank you. Uh, there's prayer, there's God's word, and all of that should feel, should feel formal and should feel important. But it's important that all of you also know the place that you have in this congregation. The place that you have in this congregation is one who is called. Every single person who is here is called by Jesus Christ. And we're all called to vocations. We're all called to serve Christ in every specific way. And seeing as if there are only five of you standing up here now, there are another maybe 200 here how God calls each of us to use our gifts in a way to celebrate him. And as you reach this point where you're getting ready to use your gifts to either what you've been doing or to new things, know that God is with you. We can't say it any simpler than that, than God is with you. Keep seeking him because you can make sure that God is continuing to seek you. So let us give them a, let's thank God and give them applause. Thank you, God, for all the good And now, if you will, go forth with this blessing. That may Almighty God look upon you and all of us with his favor in our commitment together to work and serve in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant us courage, patience, and wisdom. Strengthen us in all our call to be a witness for Christ to the world and in service to others. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
God, all that we have is a gift from you. Stir within us a grateful heart as we tithe our finances, tithe our abilities, and tithe our time. We pray that these things will be acceptable in your sight. Receive them out of gratitude for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> One bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless. And we, the many, throughout the earth. We are one body in this world. to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food. The body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ welcomes you to his holy table. All are welcome.
This is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ Katrina given for you. Donna, the body of Christ given for you. Jim, the body of Christ given for you. Jim, the body of Christ given for you. Mark. Repressed in the body of Christ given for you.
Let us stand. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen each of you and give you peace. Amen. Let us pray. Radiant God, with our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May your word take flesh in us that we may be your holy people revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
ask that you would bless this congregation and our family and friends. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless our meal. Thank you for those who have prepared it and for those who have cared to put it before us. We give you thanks for this and for all things. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now we ask that you continue to walk in Christ Jesus, rooted and built up in him, almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.